Founding member of the Department of Homeland Security's Data Privacy and Integrity Advisory Committee. I served on it about six years until maybe a year ago or so. Uh, along with working on it, we were sort of brought in to work on privacy issues, but I can't work on an issue without looking at the whole picture. And so I spent a lot of time uh, understanding that agency, understanding the psychology uh, in, in the Department of Homeland Security and in the Transportation Security Administration. A lot of people well meaning to a person, but, but the incentive structures that they face, the, the, the things that they do for us aren't necessarily in the, in the best interest of the country in total. Uh, we have, after all, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness as our, our national credo. Well, life is the part of that that refers to security. It's very important, yes. Liberty and the pursuit of happiness are the other side of that, if you will, letting us do what we want to do, letting us go where we want to go, letting us keep our taxpayer dollars to spend as our, ourselves. So taking the DHS's advice which would pr provide 100% security is not, is not our role. Uh, we have to, in Congress and elsewhere, counterbalance uh, the arguments that come forward from security agencies like DHS and, and TSA. So I've asked myself over these years, how would you do airline security? Hey, smart guy, how would you do airline security? And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the thinking that I've put into it and the thinking that I think should go into it. Uh, and it all boils down to risk management. Risk management is probably one of the most boring subjects you can find, uh, but I'll bore, with, bore you with it only briefly and go through the thought process that, that should go into to Homeland Security. First, of course, you've got to decide what you're trying to protect. You've got to choose, choose what it is that you're doing. Uh, that's called asset characterization, literally, what is it that, that you're trying to do? Uh, a security agent will, will go too broad. I'm trying to protect America. Well, if you're protecting everything, you're probably actually protecting nothing. So choose something. Then the next problem is risk characterization or risk assessment. Now, that, that has is sort of a four-step process. You need to understand vulnerabilities. Those are weaknesses. Now, lots of things have weaknesses. Airplanes have weaknesses. Airports have weaknesses. Everything has weaknesses. That's not damning. You also have to understand threats and hazards. That's something animated to, to, to do some kind of harm. Examine those, understand what they are. With those two in mind, you, you compare likelihood and consequence. How likely is it that a bad thing is going to happen, and how consequential will it be if it does happen? Now, you can't boil this down to a specific science, but if you have likelihood and multiply it by consequence, that is risk. The process of thinking all this through will basically float to the top what the most important risks are and what the things are that you should address first. Responses also run a range. Responses include acceptance. In a lot of cases, we accept risk. We do that all the time when we cross the street against a light, for example. There's a risk we'll be hit by a car, but we're better off on the other side of the street uh, even if we encounter that minor risk of, of a car zooming down the road at us. Prevention, something that makes it impossible for that bad thing to happen. The cockpit door, the hardened cockpit door on an airliner, that's prevention because it's, if not impossible, very, very hard now to access the flight deck of an, of an airplane. Interdiction is something you do to stop a bad actor, to stop the threat from coming and manifesting itself in place. What we see at airport checkpoints is a lot of interdiction. Whether it's well-directed or not is a very open question. And then, of course, there's mitigation. Mitigation is the ability to recover. It's to minimize damage should the bad thing occur. All of these things, all these responses are choices that you have. When you go to choose among those, the way to choose among them is to do cost-benefit analysis. I actually used to work here in the Rayburn building in an office just right over there. Title V was my area of expertise, regulatory law, big cost-benefit analysis junkie. Um, not that you should live your lives the way I did. Don't make the mistakes I did. But you should understand what cost-benefit analysis is and understand that done well, it will guide government efforts at security just as it will private efforts at security. Cost-benefit analysis is basically about trade-offs. And in the security area, it's hard because you're trading dollars for security, you're trading privacy for the feeling of security, you're trading a lot of things that are hard to boil down to equal opposites. You're trying to sometimes determine whether a rock is as heavy as a line is long. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to solve these problems. We shouldn't figure out what the best way forward is because not doing cost-benefit analysis is most likely going to waste societal resources. We might overspend on security, getting very little bang for the buck, and just throwing dollars, well, out, a, out the window of an airplane, if you will. Uh, there are hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars on the line. 
And it, so it's important to do this kind of analysis. You're probably thinking, or if you're not thinking at all, suggest that you should think, what do I, what do I see in the Transportation Security Administration's um, risk assessment and cost-benefit analysis of, say, the, the strip search machines, the advanced imaging technology that are so controversial and many of you are probably hearing about uh, from your constituents. Well, I'd like to think something about the risk management study that the TSA has done, but the TSA has not done a risk management study of this. And it doesn't do risk management studies or cost-benefit studies of most of its programs. At least to be precise, it doesn't do anything that it publishes. The TSA's leadership, the Department of Homeland Security's leadership, in, in both parties have talked about risk management and talked about risk quite a lot because I think they know they should be doing it, but essentially they're not doing it. And GAO reports regularly um, point out the fact that TSA programs are not based on risk management, are not based on cost-benefit analysis. They're just doing what they do. With regard to the strip search machines, which again are sort of a hot issue and, and, and regularly get attention here on the Hill, uh, there is some good news. The Electronic Privacy Information Center uh, filed a lawsuit a little while back against the TSA about this, the policy of having these machines in place and the policy of ex extending their, their use. Uh, the court did not rule in EPIC's favor on the immediate merits, but it made a very important decision uh, as far as risk management goes, I think. It ordered the, the Transportation Security Administration to do a notice and comment rulemaking. That essentially means that the TSA has to put its thinking on the record. It has to produce a docket, it has to take comments, it has to re review for the public what it's doing and how it decided to do what it does. That means essentially going through the risk management steps that I talked about. What it means is that it's the quality of its risk management, which now must actually be done, can be reviewed by a court under a, a standard called arbitrary and capricious. Now that's a far, fairly low standard. But at least it's a standard, and so far the TSA has not met any standard for implementing the strip search machines or many other of its programs. Among them, uh, David talked about the air marshals program. I think the behavior detection officers are a, a program at TSA that's worth looking at. Uh, BDOs, as they're called, are supposedly trained to spot indicators among travelers of who's up to something bad whether they're looking around furtively, whether they're sweating, whether you see palpitations in their neck that reflect a heartbeat. Well, there's no study that validates that this is actually a way of figuring out if people are doing bad or planning to do bad uh, to, to airline security or whether people just had a bad argument with the taxi driver or whether they're really anticipating badly the fact that they're going to have to go up to this checkpoint and get patted down in a way that's far too intimate for strangers to do to one another. The watch lists and ID checks at, at the airports none of the risk management validation that it needs. A program called Future Attribute Screening Technology, or FAST. It's BDOs, but with lasers. That's right, we're talking about shining lasers and using cameras that will detect people's uh, biorhythms, bio, bio activities, to determine whether they plan on doing something bad. There's no science behind this, no good science anyway. And it hasn't been val validated by risk management, nor has the liquids rule. Now we know that there's a potential liquid attack. It's real. Security is real. It's real. These are real problems. But it hasn't been shown to the public that there's a real attack that merits the liquids rule. I hear tell, sometimes, sometimes you pick up signals that the liquids rule might be on the way out. Uh, it might go, that would be good, because it would reflect without risk management that the TSA has determined that the liquids rule is too much. You may remember the puffer machines that came and went. Uh, those machines were gonna, were, would, would blow air on a person, collect the air, and then examine the air to see if there was any particulate in it that reflected bomb making or any other dangerous ar article. Well, millions and millions of dollars went into the puffer machines, and then it found that they didn't work at scale. You couldn't get people through the puffer machines. They broke down regularly. Uh, millions and millions of dollars wasted because one or two million dollars, if, if even that, wasn't spent on risk management. This is stuff that, that the TSA is not doing. And the TSA... Uh, may not want to do it because it is a public institution. It's responsive to politics more than actual security. Now, politics often demands security. In fact, politics often demands over-security, but it demands misdirected security. So the TSA was very good in, the, in its early years at looking for small, sharp objects like the objects that were used in the 911 attack. After Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, I like to say the TSA caught something of a shoe fetish. Now, after the underwear bomber, it got a little closer to us still. Before too long, new innovations in smuggling will bring the TSA yet closer to
to our lives in ways I care not describe to you today. So what are the roles? What are the roles between the public sector and the private sector in doing security? David does, does a good job of describing them in his paper. I think his, his, his thinking is sound. Government provides public goods. It provides the goods that cannot be provided privately, economically. National defense is a public good because no one individual, no corporation is going to go and defend the entire nation from invaders. We have an army that is a public good for protecting the nation from attack. That's a public good. Among the public goods in this area that the government can and should provide are the gathering of intelligence, some domestically but certainly um, foreign intelligence that, that indicates where threats may come from. Uh, working with foreign governments to suppress terrorism, that is a role of the federal government. It's, it's a good one and it's an, an essential one and one that's had a great deal of success. And of course traditional law enforcement, not necessarily at the federal level, but state and local law enforcement, they are there. A lot of their work does counterterrorism without even knowing about it. So people, people uh, call up the police and this is how the, the, the London, uh, uh, the liquid bombing attacks were taken care of. People called up and said, there's some weird stuff going on near me. The government doesn't have to ask for weird stuff to be reported. When it asks, it gets over-reporting, and then it loses, it loses track. People, good people, know when something wrong is going on in their communities, and they know to call it in. That works. We're all part of this, this, this security effort. We work with the government on traditional law enforcement, obviously support it. The private role in security is substantial, and I think the way to think about it is to start with how we secure our own things in our own lives. Do we call the police? Every time we have something we need securing? No, absolutely not. We live in houses or apartments that have doors. The doors have locks. We close windows. We have dogs. We have alarm systems. We have neighbors who we might tell about the fact that we're going away for a week or two. There are all kinds of things that we do to secure our own selves and our own things long before we call on the government to step in. And I think our own experience with security is a good analogy for how security should be done for bigger risks or in bigger sets of infrastructure uh, like airlines and airports. Airlines do have the incentives they need if left alone, if given liability for failing. Airlines do have the incentives they need to secure their operations, to secure their passengers. Uh, they lose and they lose big time if they, if they don't do those things. They also have to, and this is important, they also have to blend security with all the other interests that passengers have, including privacy and convenience, customer service, ease, all these things. And you're going to get a lot better from privately provided security from airports and airlines if it's done, if it's done privately. David mentioned insurance. Uh, insurance is a very, very sophisticated business. A lot of us don't know about it. A lot of it's really messy in areas like health. But insurers go to great lengths when, they're talking about, when you're talking about large infrastructure and large companies, they go to great lengths to make sure that they have a handle on the risks that they're, they're insuring. So insurers in this area will have a role in saying, are you doing this? Are you doing that? Let's take a look every year, every six months, every quarter to make sure that your security systems are operational and working, functioning well. Let's test it. Insurers will do this and reinsurers behind them. Um, these are all risk management systems, private risk management systems. They operate um, in a very diffuse environment. It's hard to crystallize and capture how these market forces work to create security, but they do. And I'll refer to you, I think one of the handouts was a, was a discussion called Transportation Security Aggravation, TSA, Transportation Security Aggravation, which you can also find on the Reason.com website with a, with a web search on that phrase, where I debated with, with Bob Poole from Reason back and forth about how this stuff is done. And there was a lot in that, in that article about how insurance works, how the tort system works, liability, to make sure that the providers of, of, of airline air travel are going to provide a safe experience. The most important takeaway, if there is one from today, there are many, but, but one of the most important is that there will never be zero risk. There will never be zero risk. Uh, governments often promise zero risk. Some of your bosses may inadvertently try to promise zero risk to constituents. Governments will do that and they'll fail to deliver at a very high cost. The private sector will do its best to manage risks and it'll do that while balancing privacy, comfort, convenience, and I think what's probably most important at the airport, courtesy, something we don't get from the TSA. 
Those are my remarks. I applaud David for his, his uh, paper and his point about the Department of Homeland Security and the TSA. We can do much, much better, and I think over time we will.